Good evening and welcome to another episode of Slantcast, the official podcast from Slant Books. My name is Gregory Wolf and I am Slant's publisher and editor. We're very grateful that you've chosen to share this time with us tonight. Slant is an independent, award-winning, not-for-profit literary press specializing in fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction, drama, young adult books, theology, and philosophy. What they used to call in the old days, Bell Letch. In an era dominated by what critic Becca Rothfeld calls sanctimony literature, slant authors prefer writing that remains grounded in craft rather than getting by on enlightened opinions. Writing that explores mystery and ambiguity, inviting readers to a greater sense of humility and a renewed awareness that we are all stuck in the same human boat. Asked to say something about Slant Books, author Paula Houston wrote, I was 25 when I first read A Movable Feast, Hemingway's famous memoir of literary life on the left bank of Paris. This I thought is what I need, the daily company of writers like Stein and Fitzgerald. Happily, Slant has arrived, a gathering place for some of the most talented poets, essayists, short story writers and novelists of our time. It adds some real Paris to my life. Now, come to think of it, that might make a great tagline for us. Slant books for a little Paris in your life. <laughs> in any case, tonight we are doing another online book launch event, this time for Robert Cording's In the Unwalled City, published on September 1st, by Slant. This is in fact the second title by Bob that we published. The first, entitled Finding the World's Fullness, is a collection of critical essays that explore the interplay between poetry and transcendence, including sensitive readings of poets as diverse as George Herbert, Robert Browning, Elizabeth Bishop, and Stanley Kunitz. We encourage you to consider adding that volume to your collection. Robert Cording is Professor Emeritus at College of the Holy Cross, where he taught for 38 years and served as the Barrett Chair of English and Creative Writing. After his retirement, he worked for five years as a poetry mentor in the Seattle Pacific University Low Residency MFA program. He has published nine collections of poems, the most recent of which are Only So Far and Without My Asking, which along with Walking with Ruskin were finalists for the Connecticut Book Award. A book on poetry, the Bible and metaphor, Finding the World's Fullness was published by Slant. He has received two NEA fellowships in poetry, two poetry fellowships from the state of Connecticut, and has won two Pushcart Prizes in poetry. His poems have appeared in publications such as the Georgia Review, Image, Southern Review, Poetry, Hudson Review, Canyon Review, The New Yorker, Agni, The New Ohio Review, and Orion, and have been included in a variety of anthologies, among them Best American Poetry and Best Spiritual Writing. Now, it goes without saying that if you are here tonight, You've heard a little something about the story contained within In the Unwalled City, the loss of Robert's son, Daniel. We are all the more grateful that Bob has agreed to do this event for us, knowing how overwhelming this experience is for those who must endure it. And yet writing always exists to some extent in the space between the public and the private, between the rawness of confession and the shape that literary form gives to experience. Appropriate to this is the words of the words of Martha Serpis, who said of this book, in a grieving father's voice, both vulnerable and steeled, the poet writes, my son is dead and done with me. He talks to himself through hybrid prose and poetry and to himself while talking to his son and almost as afterthought to us. He avails himself and his off-camera readers 
of centuries of wisdom, but mercifully offers us no moral summas gleaned from his devastating experience. Cording's bracing metaphors and sudden shifts of perspective distinguish in the unwalled city from many memoirs of grief and loss. We come to poetry for just this, intimacy and awakening. Those are wonderful words from Martha Serpis. Bob will read from both the prose memoir that winds through the sections of poetry in the book, as well as a number of the poems in themselves. While he is reading, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions by typing them directly into the chat box. Depending on a variety of factors, including time, I will pass some or all of these questions on to Bob and possibly toss in one or two myself. And now enough for me, my friends, Robert Cording. Hi, everyone. Hey, I want to thank a bunch of people uh, for writing these little blurbs that Greg just read from uh, Martha Serpis and Claude Wilkinson, Margaret Gibson, uh, Chris Merrill, uh, and my dear, dear friend, Sid Lee, who somehow has managed to support my work from day one. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have your face in the screen, Sid. Uh, and, 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 and of course, a whole bunch of you knew my son, Daniel, uh, and, and that's comforting to me. Uh, Bill Wenthe, a poet who is here, was there on the day Daniel was born. He, he showed up at our back door and I had just delivered Daniel. Uh, and there Bill was. All right. I also want to thank uh, Bill Wenthe and Jeff Harrison for reading most of these poems uh, in the manuscript form, and especially Jeff Harrison, who, uh, when I got stuck with this book, he, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I should divide this essay that I wrote up into smaller prose pieces. Uh, Jeff was there to, to really help me through how to break the thing up uh, and deserves a lot of credit for it, which I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm giving him. Uh, there's five sections of prose uh, and four of poetry. And my hope is that the poems and the prose sort of augment each other in some way. Uh, at least that's my hope. Uh, that said, when I do this, I'm going to ignore it and read the prose first, as Greg said, and then some of the poems, because there's no way of duplicating the structure of the book uh, in you know 40 minutes or so. So I'm going to read from a, a couple of, uh, I think it's important to read these. The book focuses around these two things. These are the epi, epi, epigraphs to the book. Really weird epigraphs in the sense that one's from Washington Irving and the other is from Rilke. Uh, but in my mind, they say everything there is to, that needs to be said that I, that I wanna talk about. The first is from Washington Irving. The sorrow for the dead is the only sorrow from which we refuse to be divorced. Every other wound we seek to heal, every other affliction to forget. But this wound, we consider it a duty to keep open. This affliction we cherish and brood over in solitude. If you've looked at this book, that's clearly what I've done. Rilke says in a letter, you must continue his life inside of yours insofar as it has been unfinished. His life has now passed onto yours. This is from the first section of prose. The, the, I, I didn't pick perhaps the, the best prose that I could read to you, but I picked the prose that I thought would allow you to get a feel for my son. Uh, I hope it's good, but it, it's, it's my son who I want you to hear. <clears throat> With grief, one day becomes another. Every tomorrow repeats today. Every day repeats itself. Grief can also be a sudden assault. Images of Daniel cuddling the cats that seem to occupy our house for years. Daniel 
maybe eight years old, climbing out his window and walking around the scaffolding we had erected to clabber our house and knocking on our bedroom window. Or later, I must grieve, it seems, every aspect of my son's life from child to adult. Daniel as a surly teenager who smoked too much pot and fought with me about everything, who sprawled in the back seat of the car, pushing his two brothers into one another. Or most recently, Daniel, completely at home at the top of a 40-foot ladder or pushing snow from a condo unit's high roof by sliding down its steep incline and letting the snow build up before him to bring him to a stop. I wander round and round, my days punctuated only by these sudden stabs of memory. Daniel was 31 when he died. Writing about one's child is like writing about one's parents. It cannot help but be bewildering and fraudulent. It's a task that inevitably smooths out all the unknown and unknowable jagged edges. I knew my son well. I didn't know him at all. Every parent can say the same. Since Daniel died, I have often wondered if his death would be more bearable if we really knew each other, if there wasn't always the unfinished, unfinished business of coming to know. Thankfully, Daniel was my Shakespearean fool. When, it's a, when it seemed to him that I was simplifying his life or life in general, or entertaining some impossible yearning as I just did, he would usually sing out, la, 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 kindly but mockingly, his nonsense for my nonsense. I'd like to say I am writing now to make my son live again. That's true, of course, in the sense that all writing is an act of resurrection, or simply a means in my case of preventing Daniel from vanishing as if he had never been. But I am also writing in part to get back my real life. Grief involves a double loss. First, my loved son, then my own life, at least as I knew it. After Daniel died, I placed a photograph of him on my desk. In it, we are sitting in beach chairs parallel to one another on the Woodstock town beach. We are both in sunglasses looking at the water. I am in my 40s, Daniel is seven or eight. When I put this photograph on my desk, I could only bear photographs of Daniel as a child. <clears throat> they consoled, not because they expressed the innocent joys of childhood, but because they were already lived moments, finished moments of his life. This was Daniel at eight. This was him at 12, at 14. They helped me believe, as I wanted to believe, that every life, no matter how shortened, is a complete life. The medieval Jewish rabbi, Nachmanides, said, when a man's child dies, it is fitting that he and those that love him grieve and mourn. But their mourning must be such that it, that it is in service of the Lord. Though each day my son dies over and over, I turn and turn to the idea that gratitude is necessary for what was, even in the midst of the pain of what is. I turn to the Jewish prayer known as Kaddish, which as Leon Welsatir says, is not so much a praise of God as a prayer for the praise of God. I would say that's where I'm at, you know, you know a prayer for the praise. I pray for praise against all those nevers of death. Daniel will never drive up the driveway again in his red truck. Daniel will never again move in that easy athletic gait of his, in clothes that always seem too large or impossibly rumpled. His wife, his mother, his brothers, and I will never see his charmed smile, which transformed his entire face and made everyone around him a, a participant in his happiness. He will never, I will never. He and I are talking, then I'm writing this down.
This is from the second section of prose. And if it seems like this is a, my son took a class for me in, in college. Another teacher sat in and read his papers uh, to make sure I wasn't just passing out easy grades. I taught at the College of the Holy Cross for 38 years. One of the greatest gifts and pleasures in my life was teaching Daniel, who took my course, course the Bible and literature. When he died, I asked his wife, Liesl, for his college papers and notebooks. They are difficult for me to read, nearly impossible, but his thinking shines through. Writing about Abraham at Moriah, the site where, of course, Isaac is to be sacrificed. He did not see some easy story of Abraham's obedience and faith, but rather saw an altar where all rationality had to be sacrificed. He knew what it was like to arrive at a place where no amount of thinking could make sense of what was happening. I see again how intimately he understood Abraham's need to control, to think he could know what God wanted. He seemed to know intuitively that Abraham had come to that place where thinking is useless, where all rational thought leads only to what is irrational. In his midterm exam, Daniel drew a connection between Abraham, Jacob, and Job. All three believe, he said, that they have a hold on the world and that their thinking divides them from others. And they are right to some extent. But each thinks they can understand what God wants. Each confuses the world that makes sense in their own human terms with God's world. And each must have, as Daniel wrote, their world shattered. When Daniel and I talked on the drive to and from Holy Cross, I tried to articulate my sense of life and my gratefulness for it. He would ask me to explain the use of the word provide in the Abraham and Isaac story. You know, God provides the ram, or just what Joseph meant by providence. If I spoke about provide meaning more than a ram in a thicket that Yahweh had already provided a creation and the commandments and had promised in, in, in Exodus to provide for the Israelites' trek in the wilderness. If I spoke of Joseph's free will of how providence didn't mean, don't worry, God will make everything turn out okay. Or if I spoke of how God did not create Joseph's destiny, but rather Joseph, because of his experiences in the pit and with his brothers, he participated in his destiny's unfolding. Daniel might nod in assent and then wonder how our free will and God's will can work together. You know, his mind worked like John Dunn's, you know, why did God make us this way if we're always going to screw up? He knew the perversions of the human will, where you might ask a question he knew would get to me. How does God's love accept that for someone with mental illness, every day is a torture? He had great questions that just, and you could answer, you know, you could say, I believe God suffers with me every, every minute. Yeah, I still do. Yeah. You just keep going on. How does God provide in that situation, he'd ask. At his funeral service, his uncle read from the hymn to wisdom in Job. I quote, mortals do not know her path, nor is she, is she to be found in the land of the living. Daniel's life swung between an ecstasy in, in being alive and the grief of not knowing, of not finding that path to meaning. His death is a shattering of meaning. Don't misunderstand me. I never expected my son's death to have meaning. I mean only that death, suffering, grief, they truly collapse our house of cards rationality. All our self-deceitful ways of thinking we know what we do not know. We always know that truth, but we gradually bury it over and over since it is since it is impossible to live in that blown blown open state of not knowing. Grief is the practice of trying to make sense out of something which can never be made sense of. It brings us back to one of the basic truths of our existence. 
we are not in control. What we want to know so desperately always remains outside our grasp. Mrs. Mr. Ramsey, Virginia Woolf's philosopher supreme in her novel To the Lighthouse, admits he can only reason to R in the alphabet of knowing. Simone Weil said we must live on the cross of such contradictions. I am trying. Now I'm gonna read uh, from the poems. And I'm gonna read them in sort of chronological order of the book anyway, section one, two from section one, two from section two, two from section three and so on. When Sid, uh, when uh, Greg read that little passage from Martha Surface about the book, it was probably a nice way of putting uh, just just how crazy I was uh, during the first year of, uh, after Daniel died. Uh, I talked to him constantly, uh, still do. And the way I thought I could continue his life in mind was basically to walk around reporting on everything that I saw. And I mean everything. Daniel, this is what I'm looking at right now. There's a red-tailed hawk over this field. Here's what's happening. Yeah. And this is a poem that came out of that. Yeah. It's called A Pair of Roseate Spoonbills. And roseate Spoonbills, for those of you who don't know, it's like a, a, a heron-sized bird, great, but heavy, heavy set, uh, bulky. Uh, but they're gorgeous. They're flamingo colored, uh, just a beautiful reddish pink. Uh, but they have this weird thing about them. And that is they have a spoon bill. It looks like there's a wooden spoon attached to the front of them. Uh, and they kind of stir the muck right in front of them. Uh, and they kind of feel the things with their bill. A pair of roseate spoon bills. Nothing brings on my need to talk like your death. That murky silence into which all my words fail, fall and yet keep replenishing themselves in dire need of second chances. I can't keep from narrating my days to you as if you were beside me here, looking with my eyes at whatever it is I'm seeing, this pair of roseate spoonbills at the moment. The contradictions of their being would have amused you. Are they ugly or beautiful? A mockery of form? or a perfection of form itself. That sunset flush of their bodies, pink and red featherings, offset by a paddle-like spoon for a bill. They stir the muck, trusting what they can feel, the water too dark to see through or shattered into little triangles of light each time a breeze sails across the marsh. Sometimes I lose myself in a kind of trance as they swing their bills, stir the bottom, repeat, repeat. It's not self-obliteration or some magical escape I feel. It's as if I want nothing else than for you to see them, how ungainly and elegant they are. Those bills so excessive, so casually strange, perfectly suited to their task and yet so comical. You'd have a good laugh at that. When you'd approach this moment, the sun's match tip of light has gone out, and in its afterglow, the pair of spoonbills have become shadows crossing the marsh in a cooling breeze that began on the opposite shore and now riffles over the water's pink flush towards where I am. This is a poem called At the Cemetery. My, my son is buried in the local Woodstock uh, Cemetery. And it, what, it's, it's very wonderful because it's about five miles from our house. Uh, it's sort of where I used to end all my walks. I'd sort of walk and end up there and think, well, I, I'll be buried here. And, and, and I will someday. at the cemetery. After my son's death, 
October leaves fell on schedule. Wood smoke blew across the field. I could find nothing to steer the days. There was only the lifeless freedom of my own helplessness. My future seemed unendurable, and yet it had to be endured. Now I meet him at his grave. A summer thunderstorm announces itself in flashes and gusts of wind that rip leaves from the maple tree beside his grave, where once again, I think of his birth. Unplanned, at home, 10 minutes from first pains to his being here. Just like that, I feel him rushing into my hands, the weight of him. I think of this so I do not lose my fatherhood. Now as trees bend south to north in the cemetery and the storm approaches groaning as St. Paul says the world groans like a mother in childbirth, I groan. Lord, grant me this fatherhood of pain. Do not let grief be finished with me, if only because it gives birth to my dead son who is both not here and not, not here. These are from the second section of poems. And that was a true story. My son was born at home in literally 10 minutes. And as my wife's water broke, he, he, he surfed out and I, and I truly caught him. Uh, this is a true story about an incident when we got called home. We, we often got called home. We, went, we, we hardly ever went anywhere, my wife and I, but when we went away, the babysitter almost always called within minutes saying, you better come home. Uh, it, wasn't, it truly wasn't worth going out. Icarus. After our son died, my wife found him in coincidences, sightings of hawks, mostly at the oddest of times and places, and then in a pair of red tails that took up residence, nesting in a larch above our barn, and how their low frequent sweeps just a few feet above us before rising over our kitchen roof made it seem as if they were looking in on us. In a way, it all made sense. Our son, so at home in high places, the edges of mountain trails, walking on a roof, or later after he became a house painter at the top of a 40 foot ladder. So many mornings we woke to the red tails jolting screeches. And even if I was a casual believer, their presence multiplied, multiplied my love for the ordinary more every day. We never thought, of course, any of those hawks was our son. Who would ever want that? But once, watching one rise on a draft of air, I thought of Icarus soaring towards the sun as if an old story could provide the distance I needed. Waxed and feathered, his arms winged, and remembered a babysitter's frantic call to come home immediately after she'd found our 10-year-old son nearly 40 feet up in an oak tree. I can almost hear him again, laughing high up in the sky, throned on a branch, his feet dangling, knowing nothing but the promise of heights as he waved to me. And I must have looked very small, crawling up to him, staying calm so falsely as I pleaded with him to come down, to come down now. Once I was visiting Sid and he, we were about to go home and he, 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 we were calling Daniel, Daniel, and he had hid himself in Sid's closet uh, and wouldn't answer our calls until we were completely berserk. Yeah. It's like, ah, here I am, uh, popping out of his closet. Uh, this may seem like it's too hard to believe, uh, but it goes along with this coincidence thing. Uh, 
th this is an absolutely true story. Uh, obviously, I tried to make a poem, but uh, the story itself is is absolutely true. And it's I, I, we 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 have bobcats by us, and we see them. Uh, but this one is special, bobcat. It came and went like a revelation, and yet was only a bobcat. And not the first I'd seen cross the narrow field behind my house to hunt for rabbits. But this one just stood there in full daylight as if it wanted to be seen, the sun turning its tan coat gold, the bright October leaves falling around it, or turning alertly in a breeze against a background of cloudless blue sky. From a window, I took the bobcat, bobcat in with binoculars, its tan coat slatted with black bars, its erect black-tipped ears, the off-white fur around his lips and chin, and those yellow eyes with black pupils that seemed to watch me as I watched, freed for those two or three minutes from the need to understand. I didn't ask how the bobcat had come to be where it was, and I to where I was this first day of my son's sudden death. It was October 14th, and though I wanted to make the bobcat what it was not, some type of offering or sign, I simply watched it come and go, though its strangeness has stayed with me, a bobcat incapable of sadness and which had no meaning or none I could grasp, stepped into the open and stood in leaf fall and afternoon's gold. Not what I would have asked for, but all that was there at home in the day's passing light. This is from the third section now. It's called Melan Melancholy's Mirror. You might know the Durer's Melancholia, uh, the woodcut of, of that. I, I happened to be looking at it one day because I was, it, it was so hard for me to deal with the fact that I couldn't do things. Uh, I, I, I pride myself on getting up and going. And, basically living a pretty highly scheduled anal life, uh, you know, and this first year was, uh, it was just an impossible year in terms of getting things done. And so I wrote this poem called Melancholy's Mirror, as if I was looking into melancholy. Uh, and it, of course, refers, of course, to the anatomy of melancholy by Burton. Melancholy's mirror. In the shadow land of my room, this warm winter late afternoon, I watch a stink bug cross my wall. Also, two flies that woke this morning and now, dazed, bump, um, bump up against the windows. I'd like to say I'm getting by and getting on with life, but the latter is a stretch. A tapeworm of grief has been eating my insides, eating the spirit of who my son was, his lively mind, his courage to accept the darkest contradictions. I've sat here for hours, my companions, these two thoughts. My son is dead and done with me. How can I know what my son's life was to him and him alone? If I set up a mirror on my desk, I'd see a cartoon of hurt and lethargy. Just before the stink bug arrived, I was staring at Dura's melancholia on my computer screen. All those tools, saw, plane, hammer, calipers, ruler, just like my son's, piled up now in my garage, waiting for me to do something with them. And yet here I sit, as if I were tied up like my neighbor's dogs. If I were a dog, 
on how all day like them, I embarrass myself. Why can't I remember what ridiculous luck it is to be alive? One of those flies just buzzed in front of my face as if to say, where have you been hiding yourself? I could ask the same question, but now it's on my nose, daring me to come alive. I belong today to my own anatomy of melancholy. It's long wait for what never happens. It's shut down of the future. It's after knowledge of death that knows no more than it did before. It's inability to complete a life that simply ended. Dura's figure, winged but paralyzed, moping, tools spread before him, but unable to create these words that lurk like insects this winter late afternoon. As you can tell from the poem that I read about spoonbills, uh, my wife and I now go down to Florida, uh, a state I'm really not crazy about, nor is she, but we, we go there four months uh, of the year now and watch birds kayak, play pickleball. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a strange, I, I mean, I, 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 I drive there and I think, why am I going here? But uh, the bird life is beautiful. But this is a poem about Naples, uh, where we live, uh, which is a very wealthy uh, place in Florida. And, uh, and I don't mean this to be satirical because I go there and I sh shop there and I buy things there, uh, I eat there. Uh, but I had this thought one day, it's called Sketchbook, Naples, Florida. Naples is, we just bought a house and it was like, we sold everything in the house and then refurnished it for almost nothing because Naples is the place where very wealthy people go to die. Uh, and you can, you can buy up uh, in consignment shops all the furniture that they left behind. This is a, in, in a way about that. Sketchbook, Naples, Florida. The royal palms bathe in the soft, warm air of February. And everywhere I look, there is the play of glittering afternoon light. On store windows and metal bistro tables, on the well-polished, always white Mercedes and Lexuses, on the sorbet, pinks and oranges and lime greens of faux Spanish buildings. The most ordinary things here seem make-believe outside of time, like images projected on a screen. And for now, this lotus land of ease and assurance serves my hazy recollections of contentment, my need to push away death, even if its reminders are everywhere, in consignment shops lining the highways, and here on Fifth Avenue, where the aptly titled Provident Jewelers keeps buying up the best silverware, china, and jewelry of the newly dead. For now, let this be another piercingly blue day in Florida, clear as a mirror unstained by reflection. Let the live oaks translate the breezes off the gulf and let the idle days pile up like cocktails at happy hour and strollers in twos and threes mosey in and out of street side boutiques and restaurants content with the intricate evasions of shopping and the driest white wines. I'll have another gin and tonic and act as if I've stumbled into someone else's reassuring dream. For any minute now, my dead son will stop by for a drink with me and together we'll watch the sun dawdle on the horizon of the Gulf this day sketched by sunlight on the threshold of dying. Just remember, I'm sitting at the bar drinking a gin and tonic with everybody else, but it may appear to be that I'm mocking. I'm no different and no better. We're all in the same place, sort of trying to figure things out, getting nowhere, trying again.
this is from the last section of the book. This one's called St. Francis of the Bird Feeders. One of the things that I really helped me uh, during the years of grief since my son died has been having <laughs> putting all these bird feeders up with these metal poles, you know, with the arms out that you hang the bird feeders from. Uh, this is, and I love, I love to stand at a window and just watch them come and go. Uh, St. Francis of the Bird Feeder. Time has dawdled away. Nothing I had planned to do has gotten done. And here I am standing at the window again, the dim winter light and gray stone of sky dulling the white of fallen snow. Birds wing back and forth to the feeders I've hung from a metal pole with arms. Chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, downy woodpeckers. And I'm looking into that circle of fluttering birds when the disk of faintly glowing sun behind the pole reminds me of the halo around St. Francis's head in Giotto's painting of him preaching to the birds, love holding them in a wheel of flight around him or lining, the, lining them up on the ground like these juncos pecking for fallen seed. And when I take it all a step further, wondering if St. Francis could show these poor birds the kingdom. My dead, son's, my dead son's voice breaks in, perfectly clear, and exactly as I remember it, mocking my need to turn a metal pole into St. Francis. He's gotten a laugh out of me, enlightened, if only a bit, the weight of the day. Even if I've already turned back to the pole, where a pair of cardinals rest on St. Francis's arm. And I wait, hoping to hear his voice again. In the last poem, I'm gonna end on a up note here, if there, <laughs> there is such a thing. Uh, I'm sitting in, uh, basically about 20 feet from Lake George right now, uh, in my brother's house. And this is a poem about Lake George. Uh, there's a place where you take your boat up to and you know we've done it for years and years and people swim to the shoreline and climb them up, you know, this rocky cliff and jump off. And there's always a whole bunch of boats at the bottom, you know, picking up everybody that climbed to the top and jumped down. And there was, my brother took a picture of my son uh, jumping from the top of the cliff. It was nothing for my son. He would have jumped off a 60 foot cliff. He, he, the, guy, the kid was afraid of, I, I literally I never saw him afraid of anything. And it was so, he, he made me so afraid I, I could hardly look at him do anything uh, because he had so little fear. This is called screensaver. I took the picture my brother had made, uh, had caught of my son jumping off the cliff and turned it into my screensaver so I could look at it. Screensaver. Sure. Every photograph is an elegy to what was. But this photograph, which I've turned into my screensaver, of my son has him suspended in midair, both rising and falling. He has just jumped from a rocky outcropping 30 feet above the shimmering water of Lake George that flashes silver and gold. The day itself is glittering with light that has the feeling of being excessive. And there are, I've counted, seven different shades of green in the hemlocks and cedars and white pines growing from the rocky soil of the island. My son is alive in the thrill of his airborne body though it is quiet in the photograph. No cheers and whoops from his friends who are waiting at the top to jump. No sounds of the boats idling below or the waves sloshing against their bobbing hulls. I will not see him cleave the surface of the lake and vanish with hardly a splash and then break back into the light, silvery water 
cascading from his hair and shoulders. And I will not see him climb back up the rocks, eager and intent on his next single second flight. But almost daily, I give thanks for this moment in which the past is gone, but never dead. This glimpse of the terrible sorrow to come, but also of something like an afterlife in which his body relaxed, calm, hovers as if it's forgotten its heaviness, the air holding him fast, halfway between two places at once, the good light of the sky and the ease of bright water that waits. Thank you all for dealing with my pain. Thank you so much, Bob. It's an incredibly beautiful reading. If we, if there was any justice in the world, we would just sit quietly for a few minutes. But um, we will move on. We've got a wonderful number of questions. Um, so I'd like to you know, try to get as many of those in as possible. Um, the first one asks how it was to write in the wake of the tragedy. Did you, did you simply not write for a time? And then how did it, how did writing recommence? Uh, yeah, how did you get back into it? What was the writing process like at that point? I, I, did, I didn't write anything. I didn't write anything for about a year. Uh, I'd say the first year I was comatose. Uh, it, it truly felt looking back as if I was in a coma. Uh, Sid used to call. <laughs> he was so nice. He would call and ask if I'd want to talk. And I'd say, nah, I, I don't want to talk. <laughs> and uh, then he'd call again a few weeks later. And I'd say, nah, I don't want to talk. Uh, and that's the way the first year went. Yeah. But my wife used to ask this question. She asked it the night Daniel died. And it's a haunting question. Uh, and the question is, where are you, Daniel? Where are you? And that, that got me writing, uh, that question. Uh, not because I think I thought I could answer it by, by any means, but I thought that one of the things that we maybe don't consider enough about death is that we need to have the love dead somewhere. We need to, we, we need to have them somewhere. Uh, and so I began writing to see if I could uh, bring Daniel into the world uh, again. Uh, or give him a somewhere to be. Uh, I still think of it that way. I, I never can think of him as as nowhere. Uh, you know, and it, it, if you remember, you know, Dante, you know, he, he walks through purgatorial and everybody says, remember me, remember me. Uh, I, I, I think I started writing again because I needed, uh, I could hear Daniel saying, remember me, remember me. Uh, and this was the best I could do. I hope that answers that question. Absolutely. The next one I maybe should save for last because it's uh, kind of a showstopper. Um, it's basically saying, uh, let me get the exact wording here in front of me. Will death end our grief or transform it? <laughs> Wish I knew. Uh, uh, definite showstopper, all right. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I have no idea uh, what happens after death. Uh, I, uh, I feel like my job, I felt like, I feel like my own job in life is to come as fully alive as a person can come. The Bible has one message, I think, from start to finish, and it's wake up. I've been trying my whole life to wake up, uh, to be attentive uh, to the world around me, and not to think of 
what will happen after I'm dead uh, or after anyone I love is dead. Uh, do, do I hope there's something? Sure. Uh, uh, I don't, I'd have to say I don't need there to be something. Uh, if I'm gonna be buried somewhere next, I'll probably let my wife take the site directly next to Daniel because I think she deserves it more, but I'll be one body away. Uh, and, you know, if all I do is, uh, if, if all we do is disintegrate together, that's okay with me. <laughs> you know, if we become food for the worms, uh, hey, I don't have any problem. This life was blessed for me yeah, and always has been. Next question. Were there texts, scripture, poems, prayer that brought you any balm? And was there something that helped you get back to writing? Well, you've sort of answered that a little bit. Yeah, I, I would say that what helped me most is life itself. You know, I have a poem where I have my son. I give my son lots of lines. He's kind of a both himself and a character in this book because he's often speaking from the afterlife uh, because I can hear his voice so clearly in my head. And at one moment, I, I remember hearing him say to me, uh, let life bring you back to life. You know, stop, stop all your thinking. Stop all this philosophizing. Just let life bring you back to life. And I think that's what happens you know, with us all is that life brings us back to life. There's, there's no, it's very hard to deny life for long. You know, in my mind, it's, it's very hard to deny life for long. I, mean, I remember at first my wife couldn't look up when we walked. Uh, and soon, you know, there was a couple of mating hawks above us in a field doing sort of spirals and intertwining and uh, life brings you back to life. Here's one. Uh, Simone Vey said, distance is the soul of beauty. Do you agree? Can you speak to the challenges to achieving artistic distance in the face of such a devastating subject and achieving such beautiful poems? No, oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm very, you know, would be like having to say, oh, sure, I did that. Uh, no problem. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the way to get distance is to hold sorrow and suffering as close as you can. You know, now that, I, 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 you know, I think the word behold, behold the world, that, that, that invitation and direction that the Bible gives constantly, behold. Uh, also is kind of a little pun on be held. Uh, I, I feel like I need to be held by my son's death. Uh, and that, that way that I get the distance that Simone Bay is talking about is only by letting the emptiness be empty. Uh, you try to fill it with anything else and you screw it up, it seems to me, out of your own need. Uh, I try to live I try to live with the hole that's there. You know, it, 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 I don't know if I do well or not. You know, who can tell? Here's the next one. Dr. Wenthe told our poetry class today that <laughs> writing a poem from a perspective other than our own is a way of exercising empathy. Have you written a poem from Daniel's perspective as a way of connecting with him? Uh, only by giving voice to things that I, I have him say, but not like a persona poem where he's actually doing a whole poem of speaking. Uh, he speaks inside some of the poems. Uh, I have written poems, I would say, from my wife's perspective, uh, a little bit, as best I could, uh, or at least about her bravery and courage. Uh, which is astonishing. And I couldn't read those uh, because I did a little test. Uh, I said, let me read the ones and 
the ones I break down on, I'll eliminate from the reading. <laughs> and basically, they were all about my, from my wife's perspective. Uh, so she, di she didn't get in here. Uh, you know, one of the things that's so amazing about uh, grief is that it's, we grieve very differently, my wife and I, uh, and yet it's never been an issue. And it's never been an issue because I think we realize this weird uh, thing that happens. And that is we feel the raw intimacy of our son's death in the same way we felt the raw intimacy of our children's births. Uh, there's, a, there's something that unites you when you have children uh, in a way that is hard to explain, uh, but is, but is an, an, an insanely intimate. And death does a, a similar thing. Uh, I'm not trying to say that there's some silver lining uh, at all, because there is none. Uh, but there's that. Uh, you're getting a number of, you know, really beautiful statements of love and support. Um, I want to assure everyone who's, who's sharing those that Bob will see those. Uh, we'll need to stick to the questions just for the process right now. So the next one is, if I may ask a writer's question tied to one element of what I hear you do so well in your work, do you have any guidance on how others can write better about the natural world? Yeah, look at it. <laughs> I'm not kidding when I say that. Uh, I think I, my, I've always up, held to something that Elizabeth Bishop said. Uh, Dana Joya wrote about this uh, in, a, in an essay when he about being a student in one of Bishop's class. And one of the Harvard students that she was teaching said, "How can I be unique? How can I? How can I do something that's you know different from everyone else?" And Bishop told them so perfectly, just look at something long enough and hard enough and you'll say something original because you'll see it from your perspective. Uh, you know, and that's what I try to do. I try to look at something long enough and hard enough until I see it, not somebody else seeing it, but some, just myself seeing it. Uh, you know, uh, his name just came up, but, uh, Bill Wenthe and Jeff Harrison, who are two people I share poems with, are about as good as observers as you could ever run across in life. Uh, Sid knows more about raising bird dogs than, than most people ever know anything, you know, because he know you gotta know something, you know, you 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 you, you gotta know things, you know. I mean, I I I once set out with field guides uh, and I'd walk. I'd say I won't go more than until I can't name something. I won't go any further. And I'd basically sit down about ten feet into the woods, you know, <laughs> and get stuck, and have to start pulling out all the field guides uh, until I got all the trees and all the plants and all the birds. And I'm also just an, a real avid. Uh, I mean, it just comes. I'm an avid bird watcher you know, for one. You know, avid kayaker, you know, so I'm around things. Here's a simple question. Has writing um, this book brought any comfort to you um, or and or has sharing the poems with others brought any comfort? Oh. It's a hard one. Uh, I think I'm the kind of person that needs to verbalize uh, pain and sorrow. And in that sense, writing this has brought me some comfort. Uh, there is no comfort, you know, for the loss of your child. There just isn't any, uh, but, and it's, it, it was, it, you know, I, I, I needed to do it for me as much as for Daniel. Yeah. It, it helped me bring myself back to life. Yeah. So I would give nothing but selfish answers uh, to that question. There was no, you know, whatever I did 
I did for me uh, and hopefully for Daniel. When I wrote the essay that is broken up in the book, this is a, a, a true story. I, 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 I wrote about three paragraphs at a time until I finished that essay. And then I sent the essay to Image to obviously the person that we both know and love, Mary Carnegie Mitchell. And I hit send and then I had a cardiac arrest. <laughs> so what does that tell you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Colleen spent the next eight minutes trying to revive me on the floor. Uh, so I don't know. It took a toll. <clears throat> Your book is transforming. Um, wondering if you've read other books with similar sorrow, like Ed Hirsch's Gabriel or David Ray's Sam's book, or were there any other poets you turned to uh, in the process of writing this book? Uh, I did read Ed Hirsch's Gabriel. Uh, I didn't really turn to poets. Uh, I, I read the usual grief books. Uh, who was Walter? Uh, you know who it is because you had him once at a conference that I went to with you. Uh, he lost his son. I uh, can't think of his name right now. Wal Walter Storff or something like that. Nicholas Walter Storff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I read his book about the loss of his son. And that was, an, you know, that, that was a very meaningful book to me. Yeah. I had met him years ago at, a, at, an, at an image conference, actually. Yeah. And I, I, had, I had been reading poems about the death of my nephew. Yeah. And he came up to me afterwards and we talked for a long time. And his book, I mean, I've read, you know, probably 30 books on grief. I, you know, I'd, I'm not sure they helped much. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not trying to say that my, mine does any better either. <laughs> you know, it, I don't know. Grief is grief. You, you, you know, reading about it doesn't help you suffer less. Uh, I'm not helping anybody do anything. You know, it's just out there. It was really hard for me to go out there with this. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I've never feared being public with something uh, the way I've feared being public with this book. Uh, you know, it, it almost seems like a, a betrayal in some ways, you know, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> I, I feel like I want to sell books. So if you're out there, uh, buy some books, not for my sake, but for Greg's new press. He's a beautiful man who does beautiful things for many, many people and has done so for many, many years. Uh, and so I'm here tonight because I owe this guy uh, for many things over many years. I'll oh, bless you, Bob. Yeah, it was kind of weird trying to start off, you know, this whole evening formally by saying Robert Gording this and Robert. I wanted to skip straight to Bob, you know, given our history and all all the all that we've gone through. Now, here's a question probably I have to answer. It's probably not fair to put on you. It's can you explain the cover of the book? Uh, no, I, I I can. Do you say have any thoughts thing. about that? Yeah, I my son loved architecture. His his major in college was. Uh, philosophy and architecture, uh, mainly straight up philosophy first, and then started taking all these architecture courses. And then he went to Harvard School of Design one, uh, one summer and did all this design work. And basically the thing that he shared with me more than any other thing was a love of old houses uh, and fixing old houses. And that, that's what he did. That was his work. He had his own business. He, he rehabbed houses and painted them and, uh, now his best friend is actually running the business, you know, out of our barn and, and still doing the amazing work uh, that, you know, they did together. Uh, and so when Greg, who found the cover image of this book, I had nothing to do with it. When Greg found this image of a, looking through a wall into a, the interior of a house, uh, I was on board in a second because I thought it caught uh, not just the un unwalled city idea of, you know, the broken wall, uh, but the interior of the house that my son would have loved, you know, to see the beam structure would, would have been a, 
much better thing for him. You can you can see the you know it's 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 almost like a post and beam structure, but you know inside the house. So I was like immediately like, yeah, great, great. Can't believe you found that, Greg. <laughs> Way to go. It took me a while, that's for sure. Uh, I looked at, you know, ruins from ancient Rome and Egypt, you know, and what is an unwalled city, you know? Um, what does it mean to feel defenseless or to have some gap punched into you, your life, your experience and absence? And then I just came across this very un pleasant looking, but still interesting architectural detail. I mean, you know, one of the things that moves me so much about the book is your honesty, you know, your refusal to sentimentalize or to, to grab for uh, comfort where it's not there and not earned and not present. And, you know, the book had to look, the book couldn't look warmer and rosier than the the, the content of it. It had to have a certain austerity and honesty about loss and emptiness and so at the risk of you know not making it as warm and fuzzy as one might want um that's the the image we chose to go with and it sounds like you feel like it works yep. beautiful wow time is flying um bob i just can't thank you enough for your willingness not only to write the book, but to share it with us for your courage, your faith, your compassion, and the example you have set with your devotion to literary craft, both as a teacher and as a practitioner, it has been an absolute honor to share this time with you tonight. And I want to assure everybody again that all of your well wishes will make their way to Bob. I'll make sure he sees all of these beautiful. Uh, things that you're saying to him and for him. Uh, so so please be assured, assured of that. Uh, in the Unwalled City is available for purchase in cloth-bound paperback and ebook editions through all the major online retailers. If you go to slantbooks.org, and I provided the link in the chat box, you can find links to several of those outlets, including IndieBound and bookshop.org. For those of us who prefer to avoid the, the big guys whose names shall not be named. We're in the midst of a busy season for Slant. We're releasing three titles within a month of one another. Next up, releasing this Thursday, in fact, is The Fate of the Animals on Horses, Apocalypse, and Painting as Prophecy by Morgan Meese. It's the second volume in what Meese is calling his Three Paintings Trilogy. The first volume, entitled The Trunken Silenus on God's Goats and the Cracks in Reality, was published by Slant in 2020. These books are glorious mashups of art criticism, history, cultural analysis, and philosophy. But far from being academic, they're written in an accessible, irreverent, and colloquial style. And yet they plumb the depths. The chapter titles alone are practically worth the price of the book. Here's one from the new volume. A painter discovers color, really discovers it, really embraces the power and mystery of color, and also, perhaps by extension, discovers the power of fate, of destiny, which is a dangerous power indeed. Heidegger, the Nazi philosopher, makes a brief appearance. Now, if that doesn't whip your appetite, I don't know what will. Because our schedule is so full at the moment, the book launch for Morgan Meese will take place in November. Stay tuned for details. So our very next book launch event will be exactly a month from now on October 12th, when we will feature the innovative and deeply poignant memoir by Nance Van Winkle, Sister Zero. In Sister Zero, a woman who never wanted children suddenly becomes a mother to her nine-year-old nephew, and her sister commits suicide at age 34. Fifteen years later, the boy will also kill himself, and in almost exactly the same manner. Narrated through short prose sections and snippets of advice, quote-unquote, from Mr. Ed of the old television show, Sister Zero exhumes the sisters' shared childhood for missed clues, interrogates memory's accuracy, and interacts with a mother who's disappearing into late-stage Alzheimer's. 
As the shock of these deaths ripples out, the book progresses in swift strokes between the tough and tender, often staring stony-eyed at a terrifying moment, then jumping forward or backward in time to a moment of quiet humor. Each chapter begins with an altered page from the official guide to the 1964 World's Fair, collages Van Winkle made as testaments to the touchstone event in New York when the sisters were children. Well, it's two tough memoirs in a row, but they're, this book, I, this Sister Zero is really beautiful. This is the cover, uh, and this is an example. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but these collages that she makes from that original guide to the World's Fair with her own sort of surrealistic uh, imagery and language. It's truly really incredibly powerful and beautiful book. Tonight's event has been recorded and will soon be available on the Slant book page, our YouTube channel, and of course, through Slantcast. You can now subscribe to Slantcast through all the major podcast outlets, including Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, and many others. And we're coming up, as we're coming up to the first anniversary of Slant's transitioning from being a literary imprint to a fully independent nonprofit press. We want to remind you that your tax deductible donations make possible the kind of intensive editing and exquisite production values that uphold the highest literary standards and ensure that quality books that might not otherwise be available or accessible are given the treatment they deserve. To support our work, just go to slantbooks.org and click on donate. Finally, Remember to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Thanks again, and see you next time.